All right, let's get started. Um, good afternoon. My name is Emily Jadif. I am the Curator of Ocean Science and Technology here at the museum, and I am delighted to be Roland's host for this afternoon's presentation. I'd first like to acknowledge that we are speaking to you from the Gadigal land as part of the Eora Nation. Now we, we acknowledge that the Gadigal people are the traditional custodians of the Bamo and Badu, or land and waters, on which we speak to you from here today. And we acknowledge all traditional custodians across Australia. Now, before we begin, I would like to announce our presenter. This is Roland Leikoff. He is the curator of post-war immigration here at the museum. We are delighted that he has joined us. He is a historian and curator and has worked as a freelance historian for international companies as well as a curator for museums and memorials. He migrated to Australia himself in 2021 and joined the museum in the same year. His work is focused on how we create and retain memories and the examples he has researched vary widely. Vietnam War veterans, Nazi euthanasia and vessels as vehicles of memory, which is one of the key areas of today's talk. As a migrant myself, I am really looking forward to Roland's presentation today, which will last approximately 40 minutes. We are recording the session as well. It will be available on the museum's website in a few weeks. You are welcome to ask questions throughout. We've decided to keep it easy by just saying post anything and everything you wanna know or wanna say in the chat function. That does mean that it will be uh, viewable by all, so if you would prefer it not to be viewable by all, you're welcome to do the Q&A section. I'm happy to um, manage that. So I'll collect all the questions and pass them off to our presenter at the end. So we will have 20 minutes for discussion when Roland finishes speaking. So let's get started. I will now ask Roland to unmute himself, mute myself, and we will begin the talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Emily. Um, I also want to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Euro Nation, of course, but also the Nungaval people, because I'm speaking to you today from Canberra on a research trip. And I want to pay my respects to them and to their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. And I also want to put up um, a warning this talk is about refugees and it contains stories about violent acts and horrible experiences that could disturb. Now, migration to Australia has always meandered between organized travel with a strong pre-selection of prospective immigrants and spontaneous self-organized voyages that challenged or even broke the rules. And for a long time, migration to Australia also meant migration by ship. And here there were clear hierarchies among the immigrants. Some traveled in great comfort, relative safety, for instance, using ocean liners or commercial companies like the Orient Line. While others began the journey with insufficient resources, unsafe vessels and no hope for support along the way. Today, I want to take a look at a small subset of voyages coming to Australia, more of the latter kind, those who took the chance to come on their own and on their own vessels, what we could today maybe call a safe, a suspected irregular entry vehicle. And the question I want to ask are, how did these travelers brave or fail their journeys? What vessels did they come on? And where are these vessels now? Now, the first group that most likely comes to mind when I talk about this, uh, those who were in the past often called the boat people, a very ambiguous phrase, really. For a long time, it was used more for people who lived among boats, for instance, in harbors like Hong Kong. Only later, in, during the 1970s and 80s, was it co-opted for those who fled from their home on boats in the aftermath of what we often call the Vietnam War, but what should be better called the second war in Indochina. There were a lot of wars in Vietnam after all, before and after. Now, 
I don't want to talk too much about the second war in Indochina, but it, it's a very complicated conflict. It's definitely um, in a way post-colonial in nature, but also was a social and structural conflict deeply embedded in Cold War considerations. And while the conflict is often depicted as being US and allies versus communists, it was a conflict between an American supported and French influenced South Vietnamese regime, organizations like the communist leaning National Liberation Front in the South and the government of North Vietnam, supported and influenced by many other governments and organizations, including the US, Soviet Russia, China, and many of America's allies. Uh, Australia participated in the war under the so-called Many Flags program, which was primarily used to show that other nations like it and Thailand, South Korea, New Zealand, Philippines, etc., also supported the American goals. Australia, and I'm using the uh, numbers from the war memorial here, provided almost 60,000 soldiers uh, between and troops. Uh, between 1962 and 1973 to the program of which officially 521 lost their lives and many others had their lives majorly impacted. Depending on how you calculate this, um, you could say that in the region, Vietnam, beyond Laos, uh, Cambodia, etc., almost 3.5 million people, civilians and soldiers perished during the conflict on all sides. And when we're calling on um, these refugees fleeing from this area, what we called in the past boat people, it's important to, before we talk about them in detail, dispel a couple of myths. First, um, while many boat people fled from reunified Vietnam, the exodus also encompassed its neighboring countries, especially later, um, for instance, Cambodia. Second, the large group of people who were expelled from Vietnam had to flee were actually um, said to be ethnic Chinese. And I say said to be, it means that the Vietnamese government de depicted and declared them as such. Many of them uh, fled to um, mainland China or Hong Kong. Third, many boat peoples actually never try to reach Australia at all. Um, they tried their luck somewhere else. It was much easier to go to Malaysia, for instance, or the Philippines with a boat, especially as we will see these boats, uh, than to other places. And many already had friends or relatives in other countries, for instance, the US, and tried to, um, were, tried to immigrate there. And finally, um, a lot of boats that left Vietnam and surrounding countries never reached Australia. They just reached a refugee camp. And these were these people often were repatriated whatever country they want uh, that wanted to take them. Sometimes Australia, sometimes not. And finally, the vast majority of people that uh, fled from the second war in Indochina, both during and aftermath, to Australia didn't come back. And this very small group of people in the end on these very small boats compared to others um, incited a very strong reaction both uh, by the Australian public and by the government. It was very clear to the officials at least that these were not illegal immigrants, uh, illegal refugees, I'm sorry, because their refugee status hadn't been determined yet. Um, the big discussion at the time was more about um, are these genuine refugees? Um, and that was a discussion that was led very emotionally. We can find many arguments that say, well, the, the, the conquest of Vietnam has ended. Um, their war is over. Uh, can these still be refugees? Um, we know that some people that wanted to go to other countries were even told by governments, officials, that it was their duty as Vietnamese to fight against uh, the communists. Um, so why were they fleeing? Um, the worst thing you could do, apparently, as um, a refugee uh, fleeing from Vietnam was to be too successful. People who were, avail um, were able to hide, for instance, valuables, gold, 
or jewelry or any other things from pirates or, uh, or people smugglers were seen as very suspect. Now, um, I want to talk a little bit more and try to uh, describe how these people were able to reach Australia in a practical sense, which is often overlooked. Uh, so first I want to talk a little bit about the journey. This is an example journey of one boat people vessel. We are going to talk about later again. And um, if you look at the map, um, you can see that this voyage would have taken around 6,000 kilometers um, if under perfect conditions. Um, now, many vessels that we today would see belonging to this group were not built for the open seas. There were fishing vessels, sometimes dragnet fishing vessels. I'm going to show a couple of pictures later that operated mainly close to the land and in coastal waters. If we try to calculate how long um, a, a, a journey like this would have been taken under best circumstances, you could say that uh, uh, a fishing boat could do seven to eight knots per hour. That means 1.852 kilometers. And that would mean that if you had perfect conditions and could travel 24 hours a day, which you couldn't, of course, you could do around 300, 350 kilometers. Um, just for comparison, uh, a modern bulk carrier uh, normally had, has a speed of around 30 knots and a fast modern cruise ship 25. Now, of course, it's disingenuous saying that this journey would have taken 70 days. Nobody was able to, um, without radar equipment and um, 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 much skill, do a 24-hour uh, voyage. It was very often that refugees had to hide from pirates and patrols, and they had to refresh their resources ashore. And while getting a boat was hard enough at all, um, getting the proper equipment to navigate it was even harder. Here are a couple of navigational instruments that or histories tell us um, people on these boats had. Um, most of the time they had a compass, like this one um, that's in the collection of the Maritime Museum that was used on the refugee vessel Hong Hai, or a map like this, a simple atlas map um, that you used for general direction. Now, you will rightly so ask, how does this kind of navigation really work, if that's your tool? And uh, we recently were able to um, bring a couple of very interesting objects into our collection. This is one of them. And it shows you how um, a navigation like this could have worked. That is, what you do is you try to navigate between points of interest, um, lighthouses, islands, uh, harbors, places that are somewhat easy to identify. Um, and then you try to do the math. You calculate how long it would take with X speed um, if you have a course of Y degrees um, for Z number of hours to get where you want. Now, I think everybody will know that this is theory. In reality, there are a lot of currents that can change your travel time massively. And it's always possible to get, of course, due to bad weather, for instance, or to having to flee from other ships. Um, if you want to find your position independently from these calculations, what you need is a sextant. And that was a prohibited item. You most likely wouldn't even have gotten on the black market. I've never heard that um, a refugee vessel had one. And um, even if you did, it takes a lot of skill and training to use it. Now here are a couple of simple pictures of uh, typical refugee vessels, um, especially in the early 70s um, and 80s, uh, early 80s, in the late 70s and early 80s, the vessels of the refugees coming to Australia or trying to come to Australia were boats similar to these, that is fishing boats, mainly meant to carry 
10 to 15 crew. Um, there were some stories about trawlers that were stolen or reappropriated, like the Song Bay 12 or the um, Hai Hong, not uh, to um, not that which is not the Hong Hai, that's a different vessel. Um, but these are very, very rare experiences. So you have these boats that are meant for a catch and for our crew. And of course, those had a lot more people on board than, were, than they were really built for. Now, I think to make it a little bit clearer how a voyage like this would have worked in practice, um, it is best to talk a little bit about the, the refugee vessel that is owned by the Australian National Maritime Museum, the Tudo. Um, it arrived in Darwin on the 21st November 1977, together with three other boats and brought 31 refugees to Australia. Um, it is a, a flush decked timber vessel with a raked stem. It has a simple screw propelled by a simple oil engine. Um, it has a main mast, more, mostly used for fishing. And it's 18 meters long, um, has a draught of 1.26 meters and around 24 tons of displacement. If you look at it, um, you can see the wheelhouse is very small. You have to sit down to um, steer the, um, the vessel and the cabin is open to the aft. Um, it is shaped like a somewhat traditional Vietnamese fishing vessel, but this vessel has a secret. It is one of the few, maybe the only um, vessel that was specifically built for fleeing to Australia or from Vietnam. The businessman Tan Tan Lu uh, pulled his resources with some friends and neighbors in 1975 uh, to have this vessel built specifically for fleeing. He owned a successful business and had supported the South Vietnamese government, which both made him um, definitely in danger of many reprisals by the new government. It took um, a team of skilled shipbuilders three, um, three months approximately to build his new vessel, which he told the uh, officials uh, of the government was meant for fishing. And his whole secret plan to flee, uh, together with others, um, took about six months to prepare, um, buy provisions, fuel, etc., in smaller quantities on the black market. Um, that means that this is actually from the outset a very ideal refugee fleeing story because Mr. Louis had the friends and he had the knowledge and he had the money to prepare properly. So when 39 people start their voyage on Phu Quoc Island, which is both close to Vietnam, Vietnam and Cambodia, uh, the first goal, like I mentioned earlier, wasn't Australia, or some other um, foreign country, it was Mersing in Malaysia, where the Lus tried to get asylum in the US. Now, this didn't work out. Um, we have only have oral histories about this, but apparently um, they were simply denied the, the chance to join their friends and I think relatives in America. They had to come up with a new plan. Um, and that plan turns out was to try to reach Australia. And if you look at the map, that's quite um, another journey than just coming here. Um, it seemed, I think, so dangerous to continue on that actually eight um, of the passengers simply left in Malaysia and tried to stay here. Now, the, the second part of the boat journey actually was rather uneventful co compared to many other oral histories we have. And that was mainly because um, the voyagers really prepared very well. The, let's say master stroke of Mr. Liu was that in Vietnam, he had his engine actually forcibly um, destroyed. He acted as if it was an engine failure and asked for permission um, uh, from the government to procure a new engine. And this one, 
the one he bought was actually massively oversized for a vessel of this size. So everything that normally happened to other people fleeing didn't happen to them because their vessel simply was able to outrun everybody they met. However, to avoid official patrols, patrol boats by governments, they had to do pretend fishing, um, that is stop almost for a day and act as if there were a normal fishing boat, which prolonged their journey, of course. And as you can see on the map, made several more stops possible. In the end, uh, this was a new ship and it had a new powerful engine. So not only was um, the group able to come into Darwin Harbor on their own power, they were even able to tow another broken down vessel into the harbor. In a way, this is the ideal journey that Benny wished for, but many refugees were not so lucky. They only had old fishing boats, no navigational instruments, an untrained crew, few resources to work with. Many boats broke down or were severely damaged in bad weather. Food ran out, engines failed, disease struck. The resulting journeys were in the older histories we have, for instance, in this book, it's just an example of many, often very painful and traumatizing. Ships sank, people died on the way, boats were boarded by pirates who took all valuables. And those of those ships that lost engine power on the way, we of course only know about those that were rescued by chance, for instance, by passing fishermen. Many others, we can at least guess, never reached their destination. Now my talk so far has made it clear that these vessels are important artifacts connected to a major event in Australian history, not just Australian, regional history. And a lot of people uh, have a deep connection to them. Um, a question that very few people ask however is, what did happen with these boats when they arrived? Um, you will see in my next, the next part of my talk that for the bureaucracy in Darwin, for the government and for those in the ports, these boats were actually a nuisance. Most history only talk about the people coming to Australia and then stop. Uh, the boats are left behind, both by those who came to Australia um, and by those um, who try to remember them. Um, I'm trying to continuously unearth more information about this, but what I can say right now is that for different reasons that I will show now, um, the people on these boats that came to Australia actually had very good reasons not to care, not to look after their boats. And what I also can say right now is that the local authorities as well as the authorities in Canberra were very unsure simply unsure how to act. There was a process for dealing with the people. There was a, um, 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 a migrant hostel in Darwin, but there wasn't a process for the ships. And I would try to show a couple of official documents from the time from the National Archives to uh, explain that a little bit in a more detail. Um, the problem was that more and more ships were lying in Darwin Harbor and in other harbors in the Northern Territory. And um, while the people that landed were often eager to sell their vessels, they couldn't because these ships had been imported to Australia illegally. And while these refugees weren't illegal, uh, the ships definitely were. You had to acquire an import license and for that you had to be a resident at least and have all your paperwork in order. These abandoned boats became both a nuisance and a kind of spectacle in a way where everybody had a story to tell about one of the ships and a place where they were lying in the mangroves. And everybody agreed this was a problem, but nobody really knew what to do. Um, it seems today that that we don't have a lot of these ships left, that most vanished and are lost, was because um, there were several government agencies that were in deadlock of the, over how to proceed, how to tackle the problem. Um, there definitely were voices that said, we should allow local businesses to acquire these ships. It doesn't make sense to let them rot. But um, as I said, that wasn't possible, um, or at least, the responsible government department wasn't budging. 
the Minister for Immigration and Ethnic Affairs, McCullough, um, looked at the whole problem from the viewpoint of its general immigration policy. And that was that refugees were supposed to not come to Australia, but to stay uh, and land in camps in Malaysia and Thailand. There, they could be slowly be processed, interviewed for eventual resettlement to Australia. He made it very clear that he was not very happy that nobody listened to this agreement. However, the authorities, of course, that had to deal with all these boats in the harbor didn't really gain anything from this kind of admonishment. There was really a strong interest locally in the boats. Many people had a feeling that uh, these boats could be treated as a chance, not as, as a problem. And that was both from official organization and for individuals. Here, for instance, a letter we find in the file from a man who wants to buy a boat to retire on. Um, and he has a very clear idea of what kind of boat he wants. Um, now, if we ask ourselves, why was this uh, import ban uh, there at all? Why was it upheld? The official explanation is that both in legislation and procedure, this ban was meant to protect the Australian shipbuilding industry. Of course, they, uh, they, this makes sense only on a certain level because these boats, you couldn't buy them normally on the Australian market. Um, they were not uh, your usual vessels you could acquire, but still the ban was in effect. On the other hand, um, the reluctance to, to come to a decision about what to do with these boats also seemed to be based on a question of diplomacy. After all, um, if Vietnam now was a collectivized nation, weren't all boats in a way property of the government? There were government uh, agencies that really would have preferred uh, the solution to be to declare all these boats property of the Vietnamese government. That would mean they would have to be removed from the harbor or scrapped and the cost would have to be carried by the Vietnamese government. But again, um, for the Darwin Port Authority, for instance, all of this discussion that was going on in the background didn't change anything about the core problem that there were dozens of boats rotting in Darwin Harbor and blocking it basically. Now what happens was that the Port Authority began to write letters to the people who came on these boats to please remove them from the harbor, which in a way is almost comical if it weren't so sad because these people already had been removed from the Northern Territory, most of them, and like spread all over Australia into other migrant hostels where they were basically under house arrest until their claim was processed. So we have this case where uh, people who are in Melbourne in a migrant hostel get a letter asking them to remove their boat from the uh, harbor in Darwin. And I think if you think about it, um, you're not allowed to sell your boat because that was made clear. And um, you're also not, not there anymore. I can understand why some people simply forgot conveniently that they ever had a boat they owned or with which they came to Australia. Um, now at this place, um, especially in regard to the sale of the boats because these boats were sold, even if the agreement wasn't there, some people did it. Um, well, you could write a book about Terry Kincaid, but uh, I can't yet because I only have a little bit superficial research about him and what he did. Um, you will find a lot of press articles of the time that call him the Admiral. Uh, and that is why he, uh, because he decided to take it on himself to help the people that came to Australia sell these boats. And he was pretty much successful in a lot of situations. However, if you see, uh, if you take a look at this telegram from the file in the National Archives, you can also see that at the time when many were sold, they were already very decrepit. They were already very neglected and basically useless. Uh, 
Uh, both needs constant care and nothing's worse to have it lie in the water or even worse or land. Um, here are a couple of examples that are from the files, some curious from the Maritime Museum uh, assembled in uh, the Northern Territory. What you can see that um, Vietnamese fishing vessels very often use timbers that are very wet. And when those dry out, uh, the effect is really devastating. You can see uh, with the vessels to the upper left, yet you ba can basically put your fist through the hull already. Um, so the few boats that actually survived had to be eaten, either bought very early or someone would have to buy them and look after them. And if you look to the lower left, uh, you might maybe recognize the vessel to do, uh, about which I've talked earlier. Now, it has been heavily repainted. It had uh, a new name, the V Belief, but it was the to do, to do meaning freedom, by the way. Um, and it was in this um, state that um, a curator from the Australian National Maritime Museum found the vessel and acquired it. Of course, a lot of other vessels did at the time what um, the boat on the right does, and that is rot in the mangroves. Now, um, you can see here a ship arrival list and uh, the to do on it um, under his um, designation. And you can see that it brought 31 people to Australia. You can also see how many people were on, a, on many of the other boats. It was uh, approximately always the same number, sometimes more, sometimes less, but almost always under 100, um, uh, around 30 to 40 to 50. As I said, the, the journey of the Tudo was a lucky one. Um, not only were they brought to Australia unharmed, um, when they arrived, uh, Mr. Liu was able to sail his boat very fast, very quickly, immediately. Um, um, and um, that was a very good idea because very soon they were moved to the Vacal Refugee Center in Brisbane for four months. And then they were granted asylum in Australia. Then they scattered all over the country. It actually took several decades until they once so again you reunited with their vessel and it took the Maritime Museum quite a long time to find all of them. Um, you can see on one of the pictures uh, the family thrown confetti of um, the newly repainted and relaunched to do in Darwin Harbor, um, Darling Harbor, sorry. Um, I think the most interesting thing is if you listen to their oral histories, how different uh, they remember uh, the vessel and the object. The children really don't remember much about the boat itself. They remember the journey as an adventure and they remember specific things they did on board, for instance, playing or cooking. However, um, the adults often recounted the boat being a very important tool, but also something of a necessary evil. It was a very emotional reunion, but it also shows that refugees and refugees and their boats have a relationship that grows when they have arrived. It is hard to realize for them that one day the tool, the most important tool of escape will be seen as something more than simply a boat, either by them or by people like us, curators and conservators and those who want to preserve these boats for future generation. Um, the the Tudo is now in the parking lot behind the museum in Sydney. You can see it here and is slowly being dried out in a controlled way without damaging the timbers. Um, it really was never meant to be in the water forever. And it was meant for one specific journey. Um, and that means a lot of conservation work, but also a lot of chances for interpretation. Um, depending on how you count, um, that means that right now, what you would call a Vietnamese refugee vessel need maybe have three left in Australia. The Tudor here in the Australian National Maritime Museum in Sydney, 
the Hong Hai in the National Museum in Canberra, and the Thin Wong in Darwin in the Museum and Art Gallery of the Northern Territory. That's all. And that's a very small number of vessels from the junk armada that was said to threaten the Northern Territory and the country beyond. Um, I think it's not surprising that the actors in the past did, did not have the foresight or let's be honest, not the luxury to understand the value of these boats, how important they were then for them. Back then they knew, but how significant they are today, they wouldn't be able to uh, see. So it's things, it's our responsibility to preserve these vessels, not just as artifacts, but mainly as anchors to retell these stories. Um, the stories of these people that decided to come to Australia in such a dangerous and, um, well, pain in for many painful and um, harrowing way. Um, I think this story has become a part of, of Australian history, even an essential part. And um, that means that these surviving tools of escape are maybe the best tools we have for telling their story to current and future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. That is a fantastic. Um, I really appreciate it knowing that. And I can't, um, Tudo to me is such a beautiful vessel. It's hard to think of it ever being considered a part of something called a junk armada. <laughs> You know, it is, yeah, but um, it is hard to identify it when it's still in front of your eyes as a working object. Absolutely. Now, um, I'm going to remind everyone that the floor is open for questions. So if you have any questions for Roland, put them in while it's hot. Um, I do have a couple here, so we'll get started on those. Ooh, um, Oh, this is a great question. Roland, um, can you tell us if there's been any maritime archaeological work done on these vessels? And I, uh, this is, this is uh, a question that uh, I was quite interested as well in as well as soon as you started mentioning the vessels decaying and the mangroves up north, I thought, ooh, ooh, so um, please. That's a good question. Um, actually, um, in all my research until now, the only place where I found anything in that regard is in diving guides, uh, uh, where you have like great wrecks to dive in in the Northern Territory. There are, not, for instance, in the Northern Territory, there in those guides, there are definitely refugee vessels mentioned. But um, as far as I know, um, I have never heard about a proper work of trying to identify specific vessels and um, doing proper uh, um, maritime archaeological research on them. Mm. Um, if I had to guess why, um, it is, I, I don't think we have a lot of um, iconic vessels left that were lost. Very often, I think, um, when you do maritime archaeology, as far as I understand it, you would uh, know uh, a lot more about that than me. You search for a vessel that that you have a, a specific reason uh, for, for searching. And um, uh, the vessels we know and remember, of course, all arrived. Yeah, that would be my explanation. But I hope um, someday someone corrects me. And so, no, Roland, there are a lot of, uh, has a lot of work being done on this vessel you never heard about. But right now, I haven't heard about anything. No, the only thing I've ever heard is a, a friend of ours many years ago was wanted to do a PhD on, on vessels that were wrecked um, in Europe that had come from North Africa, but he, he went on to work at Boeing. And so <laughs> <laughs> that didn't happen. I've never it, heard of anyone else. It's interesting. Uh, a couple of Vietnamese vessels actually have brought to other countries. Uh, there is a small town in Germany where uh, one of these boats is just in the middle of the street. It was uh, brought, uh, like, uh, rescued by the uh, Cap Amamur, the legendary refugee rescue vessel, and then brought to Germany and, like, gifted to the city. Um, mm -hmm. And now it's rotting there, which is also not very good. But, uh, yeah, that's about it. That, that leads into to a really good uh, next question, which is about memorializing yeah. these vessels and the, the journeys. Do you know of any attempts to recreate 
these journeys as a form of pilgrimage or, or tribute? Not yet, actually. Yeah. Um, I think the most tributes people actually do for these um, vessels is build models of them. We mm -hmm. had re several examples on where people do that to remember them. Um, it would be interesting if people did that, like we had the Great Walk um, that was recreated here in Australia, which was um, also um, had political symbolism. And it would be possible to do that these days, but I haven't heard about it yet that anybody did it, um, even less with some uh, a vessel like this, which really isn't meant for the open ocean. It, it would be tough to do safely. I, I understand. That. It, yeah. it is possible. And I'm pretty sure once we are even more secure in our ability to like just spontaneously cross the ocean, maybe people will think about it more mm -hmm. and remember their ancestors that way. But right now it would still be very, you would need, still need a lot of knowledge and of course a lot of money. And I think most of the routes people really have taken are not very well known beyond um, um, like the harbors they visited, um, which would be doable. I think um, in the past people have taken boats and visited all the places mentioned in the Odyssey. So I think one day someone will be will do that, but I don't think it has happened yet. Yeah, well, thank you. And that was a question from Peter. Thank you very much, Peter. Now, um, I another question that we have here is, Obviously, vessels are really large and, and complex objects associated with these journeys. And you also mentioned the compass. Are there any other objects associated with, with these types of, of journeys that, that you find really compelling or, or you can think of off the top of your mind that are in collections? Um, I think the most impressive ones that are new are definitely the maps. Uh, very recent recent editions, uh, but I mentioned them, and the compass, of course. Um, most of the things that were connected to these vessels are actually lost. Um, very few objects were retained because they're also mostly everyday objects. Um, you have to, if you want to um, show something like that, either retell the story or recreate them. I know that for the Hong Hai, the vessel that is now in the National Museum, the shrine that was on the vessel was recreated because the curators found it very impressive that, um, or interesting, like it's, let's be honest, back then it would have sounded exotic uh, that this was a part of this, this vessel. Um, and so uh, painstakingly, um, the shrine was recreated. But of course, these are props. They are no real objects. The only objects um, connected to Tudo, for instance, we have are really most likely the compass and a two-way radio and uh, one frying pan. But that was given to the museum much, much later by one of the passengers. And we also have a... Um, uh, I think a cassette player that was used on it, but uh, many of these were completely cleaned out and there were very few objects that were retained that are not props um, that were then bought with the help of the people who came on them. Um, maybe other museums have something. I hope I can look at the collection of the National Museum tomorrow. And maybe I can ask the colleagues in the Museum and Art Gallery of the Northern Territory if their vessel, the Thin Wong, came with anything. But it's very sparse. It's a good point. Uh, thank you, Roland. Uh, Roland is calling us today from Canberra. He is on a research trip, so we're delighted that his connection is, is, is good down there. Uh, look, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, because you would go on the, this type of journey with whatever you could bring on board everything that you needed on the other side. So yeah. not only would it be necessity, but it would also be wanting to retain memories of that voyage in your family for many generations. So that makes sense. Now, this question is on completely the other side. So how were these boats treated by the Royal Australian Navy on their arrival in the 1970s? That is a very good question. And um, if I... If I could, from those stories I've read and from those pictures I've seen, uh, could 
like try to get a, give a general answer to that is that there were no, was no consistency. And mainly there were no, there weren't really a presence. Um, you will see that um, on a lot of these, um, um, on the lot of the early vessels, they just turn up in the harbor and everybody's surprised and looking at them. And um, sometimes um, people swim to the, to the shore and just ask uh, for the police to send, to be sent to them because they're refugees. Now, a lot of these stories are really um, not believable in a world like ours where the seas are um, back to the wooden walls that uh, we always heard from uh, uh, from the um, from Great Britain that protected it. Um, it was a very we, we have um, definitely I know that uh, several of these boats later were found before they came to Australia by plane. Um, but still, there is no um, no oral history that says anything about um, for use of force or um, something like trying to turn around the boats. Um, they were brought into the harbor and then it was uh, the responsibility of the Port Authority and the immigration um, uh, mini Ministry of Immigration and Ethnic Affairs to deal with them. Um, so it's a very low key uh, presence and I hope I will be able to do more research in this area. Sort of on a on a case by case basis. It's nice when we could do that. We didn't have the um, surveillance on our seas in the Northern Territory than 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 we do um, now. Um, so look, this is this is kind of a weird one, but an interesting one if you can answer it. Uh, is there any? Has anyone done any analysis on how many people who left might have made it to safety? <laughs> um, no. And uh, a hard number. That's yeah. no is is the short answer. The, the long answer is um, I will be honest in this regard. I think most of the numbers that are mentioned in the literature should have should be looked at again, because um, um, I'm not sure where they're from very often. Um, I I never seen anything like an official number from Vietnam that would guess how many people left. And I will would very much doubt that it will ever be possible to get that because um, we see that as a very Australia centric uh, experience. But as I said earlier, it wasn't really. It was a, an exodus that very often had completely different goals and uh, areas where people wanted to go to. Um, that means all the numbers we have um, really cannot correlate with uh, a lot of the experiences. For instance, one of the models I recently was able to see, uh, and the picture that someone built about a ship is has a registration number I've never seen before. Why? Well, it never reached Australia. It just came to a, a refugee camp, uh, I think, in Malaysia. Or in, um, and so it's basically of the of the radar the only chance you would have would be for someone to go to the vietnamese archives if they are these types of archives are accessible and try to gain something through researching fishing boat registrations all these boats have registration numbers so you would have to look at a kind of drain of fishing vessels um, during these years and then compare them to the official numbers we have. That would be great. And I hope someday someone will get uh, the finances to do that, to spend a couple of months, I guess, in the Vietnamese archives and go through Vietnamese uh, documents. Maybe someone in the audience would want to do that. That would be really great. I think that's the only approach you could take if you want to try to find out how many people possibly could have left that would be my answer. Thank you, Roland. And, and we have a note here from Karen um, that says it's a very, it's a very good point that refugees are often not allowed to bring objects into the country through customs. So, exactly. Um, you know, that's and true. Then, 
a note a note for you, for your fun day tomorrow that the NMA do have the Dan tray. And I may be mispronouncing that. So um can you, uh, I'm pretty sure that's typed in the chat so I can read it there. Yes, you can read it directly and you don't need it to be um, um, translated horribly by me. Now we <laughs> let's lead right on to another question. We probably have time for for just one, maybe two more. So this let's go with the physical aspects of the voyage, the noise, the smell of the engine, the rolling of the boat, all of those things that speak to us of a long time spent at sea. Do we have any oral histories or notes or diaries that show that these experiences remain in the memories of refugees? Um, if we had, would we trust them is the better question. Um, I know that especially for those who were children on the boats, there are often specific sights or smells that they remember very strongly. So third, I, I can't tell you a specific example right now, but I know that I've read several times that um, when they are reunited either with the vessel itself or the story, they remember specific experience that is connected to the voyage. And often very positive, that is a kind, a kind of food they're rem remembering or generally the smell. Um, but I'm personally also, also always very skeptical. Everything I've read it says that it's very hard for people to retain this kind of specific memory. Um, and there could be a lot of construction going on afterwards, like ascribing um, uh, certain experiences into the past that you didn't have there. But it, it's, I think um, we all try, especially uh, with these journeys, to get a very, a, we search for the visceral experience, the special experience, and try to get to understand how it was. Was the hold very small? Was it all very cramped? Um, uh, uh, was everybody very hungry? So we search for the emotion and description that is very um, um, unusual, not on our radar and um, different. And you mostly get unexpected answers. Very many people who talk about these journeys, talk about things we don't expect that are very, um, um, very unemotional almost. Um, if I read them, ex except for people that had very bad experiences, like horrible ones, uh, because they were attacked, for instance, um, it reminded me a little bit of the oral histories of astronauts, which were always criticized by the press back then because they had so few emotions. They were always asked, what did you feel? How was it, what did you experience? How did it smell? What, what was the taste like? But they were so in their, their practice that they had, uh, their routine they were doing, that they couldn't answer these questions. And um, yeah. Oh, I think it, it's, well said, well said. Now, I think we just have one time for one last question. So I'm going to hit you with this one from the Nerdy Historian, Roland. You said that these surviving boats now act as anchors to tell these important stories. Objects have been important, but I think the boats are probably strong sites to reflect and remember this history. What other sites of memory have been made by refugees themselves with the absence of these boats for refugees? Well, um, I think we have a lot. Uh, I wouldn't say a lot. Uh, we have several um, boat people monu monuments, um, both in Australia, um, also internationally. That these are very different. And with monuments, and another interest of mine that I could talk about for days, you always have to ask yourself who is who who formed and influenced the, uh, the identity of this. Most of these are tenders, artistic tenders, so people are uh, free to send in their ideas and then they realize that not every not always is the community very happy. But um, there, I have a list somewhere with pictures and um, um, 
both pe of both people memorials where communities try to memorialize their remembrances and they're very different they're actually radically different some of them are very um uh, explicit um they have a boat as a symbol but few of them have a lot of them are more um artistic like there's one i think i I, I can't say where it is. It's a woman with a lot of doves that are flying into the distance. Um, now, um, it is always hard to say who, how, how strongly, basically, what kind, what part of the community is creating these kinds of uh, methods of remembrance. Who is influencing it? Who is doing the decision making? But there are definitely memorials done. Um, and I think they are um, not as impressive as the real deal at the vessels, um, but there are really few other ways of expressing your connection to this part of uh, his world history um, that you can do. But that's one of the, again, that's memory and memory theory. We could talk a lot about that, that it's very hard for the individual uh, to express himself in a way that um, that memorializes his experiences physically into the world, and it's getting harder every day. So um, it's very hard, for instance, to get your own community memorial uh, realized in your part of the city, which, like when you get a hundred years back, which was very usual to have a small memorial on a on a graveyard, uh, not just. Com uh, related to um, um, to a war or something, but for people lost at sea, for instance, Th that were, were often grassroots initiatives, and it's simply getting much much harder to do that these days. So that's I think why it's so rare to find it. Well, thank you, Roland. Um, please join me, everyone, in thanking Roland for what was a, a deeply researched and thoughtful presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed on a very important object in the museum's collection, which is currently located in the parking lot be behind the museum at the moment, which is not as bad as that sounds. Look, <laughs> it is a, a really lovely display and lots of exciting things are planned for it. So please do come and check it out. I see some hands raised with applause. So uh, that's fantastic, Roland. Now, thank you all for joining us. Join us please next month to hear from our special projects curator, Kaylee Bartney, who will be speaking about the museum's Valerie Taylor collection, which is a collection of over 10,000 images donated by Valerie herself. It is a fantastic collection and Kaylee has been working on this over the last couple of years. I think a lot of us will be joining it to see these beautiful images. This will be on the 4th of October at 4 p.m. You can find all the forthcoming talks as well as recordings of the past talks on the museum's website by looking up the tag beneath the surface. Thank you so much for joining us. It is now five o'clock. You are free to go. And Roland, have a wonderful time in camera. Thanks so much. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Goodbye. Bye.